Hello everyone, and welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well out there in this very difficult time. Today I want to talk to you some more about adversary search and talk in particular about depth-limited Negamax search and alpha beta pruning, two techniques that turn out to be super important in doing realistic searches on problems with large state space like chess or even checkers. So let's talk a little bit about this whole depth limited approximation and how that works. So if you remember last time, we talked about Negamax search as a recursive thing. If you have a bunch of moves as an option in the game state you're currently in. You're sitting there looking at a chessboard. It's your your side is on move, and you want to figure out what move to make. You can value all the successor states of the moves you could make, and that will tell. And then you'll pick one that has the worst value for the other side because by zero sum, that means the best value for you. And we call it negamax search because we want to maximize the negation of the opponent's position values state values. And so we asked, well, how do you calculate the opponent's state values? Well, you use the same reasoning. The opponent considers all the moves they have in that state, the successor states of that, and picks a move with maximal negated value for the opponent, for you. And what we said is for a game like tic-tac-toe, that process will eventually bottom out. If I do this, then you can do that, and if you do that, then I could, I could do this, and so forth, until we get down to a position where there's no more to do because either it's a draw or one side is won. And that's great for tic-tac-toe, where the search tree is neither particularly deep or has a scarily high branching factor. For chess, where the branching factor is about 20, and the depth of the search tree the average depth of the search tree is probably 60 or 80. Well, 20 to the 80th is a ridiculous number. And yes, some of these things recombine, blah, blah. But the point is this, the estimated state space size for chess is such that if you try to search all the way to the end of every possible chess game, you won't even get started before the universe ends. So we need a better plan. And the plan starts with the first thing that you learn, if you actually learn to play chess, one of the things that people teach you is the piece values. Uh, we say, well, a queen is worth eight or nine, and a rook is worth five, and a bishop and a knight is worth maybe two or three. Eight or nine what? Five what? Two or three what? Pawns. So a pawn's always worth one in this system. How much is the king worth? Well, the king is worth infinity, because if you can ever capture the king, you win the game. Of course, in chess, you don't technically capture the king, but you would if you went one more move. That's what checkmate means. And so, where did these piece values come from? Because they aren't real. There's no nothing in the rules of the game of chess. You will find no chess tournament in which it's scored based on the piece values. And indeed, the piece values aren't even really right necessarily, right? You can be in a position, you can easily construct chess positions where it's your opponent's turn to move and you have all your pieces and all they have is a few pawns and yet they have a winning move, they can beat you. So being ahead on material doesn't guarantee a win. Oh, what do we call that? That's called a heuristic, right? Usually, if you're way ahead on material, you're going to win. And in fact, except for really, really weird situations, if you're more than three pawns a good player and you're more than three pawns up on a bad player, it's, or sorry, on another good player, um, the player three pawns up is going to win essentially all the games at that point. And so it's a heuristic. And the reason that the heuristic values queens more than rooks and rooks more than knights and bishops is that the queens have a bunch of options that the 
rooks don't have, the rooks have options that the knights and bishops don't have, and so forth. It turns out that those numbers were arrived at empirically. People played an awful lot of games of chess and sort of mentally adjusted the values of the pieces until they found out that, you know, sort of trading a rook for a bishop and a knight was a fairly even trade, or trading both rooks for the queen eh, may be a fairly even trade. And, you know, the numbers get tweaked, but heuristically, it's a good good measure, a good heuristic measure of what the piece value is worth. Why am I making such a big deal of this? Well, because we need a way to limit the depth or the breadth or both of this search so that we can search a smaller space and still make good moves. Maybe not provably best moves, but moves that are strong moves. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna mess really with the depth a lot more than the breadth. So, first of all, we're gonna say, well, a good first evaluation of the value of a state, if you don't want to figure it out not by search, a good heuristic value would be to add up, like they teach you to in beginning chess, the value of your pieces, subtract the value of your opponent's pieces, the material values, and that's a good, and by good I mean not terrible, heuristic estimator of the value of the position. And if that value is, like I say, strongly positive, then you're probably winning in that position. If that value is strongly negative, you're probably losing in that position. Probably, it's just a heuristic. And if the values are pretty even, then it's harder to tell what's going on. You might sort of estimate that that's a draw. So, The thing is, these are pretty rough heuristics, and you'll find that you won't play very good chess if you just pick as your move the value that chooses to the heuristically worst state for your opponent. Beginning chess players play like that a lot. It never goes very well. What we're gonna do is something a little more fancy. We're gonna sort of go ahead and combine state space search with this heuristic estimate of state values to get some better thing. So let's play a game that I call chess in end moves. So we're gonna sit down at a chess position, I and you, and we're gonna play a game that's like chess, except instead of being scored on checkmates, yes, if you if you get a checkmate, you win, and if if I get a checkmate, I win. But if after some number of moves in, by each side, the game's not over, there's no stalemate, there's no checkmate, then we will declare as the winner the person who has more material points. We'll do that thing we did and just use that estimated heuristic value as the winning value. Okay, let's think about chess in one move, right? So I'm. I, it's my turn to move first, I make a move, you make a move, and if my move doesn't result in checkmate and your move doesn't result in checkmate, then uh, we're, we uh, figure out who has more points. In that situation, I'm gonna make some moves that don't look very good in real chess. So for example, the famous fool's mate might involve a queen's sacrifice, if, depending on how it's played. And so, if we're playing chess in one move, there's sort of no queen sacrifice that makes sense, right? Literally, any time you, you, you have your queen where I can capture it, I should just capture it. There's no downside. Well, what if we play chess in two moves? Well, now you have a chance to respond. And maybe, if it's a very shallow checkmate, you can get a checkmate, so you're, it might make sense in some limited number of situations to sacrifice your queen. The key idea here is that the deeper and deeper we go, the, the more and more we look ahead doing this Negamax recursive search before finally bottoming, bottoming out and using the heuristic value, the more that the game starts to look like moves in an actual game of chess. And chess in 20 moves, you'd play pretty much like you play normal chess because nobody can look 20 moves ahead anyway, and even computers can't look 20 moves ahead thoroughly. 
And so, that isn't quite true, but that's because of a trick I'll show you in a bit. And so, you know, you're really going to get strong chest moves if you can figure that out. And yet, a depth limit means that there might be some feasible amount of moves I can actually explore in a reasonable amount of time. And in fact, there's a theorem that says that as you increase the depth, the estimated value of your position and its successors converges on the true value. And it's a theorem that has a whole bunch, it's due to Perl and some other people, and it has a whole bunch of caveats. It's, but overall, under some reasonable set of assumptions, the deeper you search with a heuristic, the better your moves are gonna be. And so that's how chess players play. Now, there's one more trick here. And that trick is a good example of pruning, of not searching some states you don't care about. Remember we talked about win pruning last time, the idea that if you find a winning move, there's no point in continuing to search because you're not gonna find a better than winning move. Uh, this is a sort of a generalization of that. And the idea here is that if I find some particular score for some state, for some move, right? I look at the successor state of some move in my current position and I find out that it has a value of three for me. And later I'm exploring some other move and it's with its state I find out that my opponent can force me to it most two. That, that my opponent has a thing that can achieve a score of minus two for them and therefore at most two for me, then I can stop searching that branch because there's no, we've already found that that move is worse for me, so I'll never make that move. I'll move into the one that gives me a score of three and guarantees me a score of three instead of the one that my opponent will get me two or worse. That's what's called alpha beta pruning and it's called that for obscure reasons, you can look it up. And so it turns out that applying this technique is super powerful. Uh, here you can see that we've achieved a score of 0.7 for us after searching this whole leftmost branch. And now down here, we find out that our opponent can achieve a score of minus 0.5 at least because we found a move for opponent that achieves 0.5 along its left branch. Well, that means we don't need to search any of this stuff because we've already shown that the opponent can get a score of at least minus 0.5, which means the most we could get by taking this move is 0.5. We know we can get 0.7 by going here, so there's no point in searching this. And so we do what's called an alpha beta prune and we eliminate this giant pile of states. How good is this? How powerful is this? Well, it turns out that if you were able to order the moves perfectly so that you considered the best state for best child first at every uh, at every depth, then you would cut the depth of the tree by a factor, effective depth of the tree by a factor of two. That is, you'd search the same number of nodes on average with a depth 10 search that you would search with a depth 20 search without alpha beta pruning. So that's a big deal, right? 20 to the 10th versus 20 to the 20th is a huge, huge, huge factor difference. And so you have to have this alpha beta pruning in your program and you have to have really good move ordering, heuristic move ordering. Um, you know, you wanna consider the states for each side from best to worst for that side. And if you can do all that, then you uh, then you're in good shape. Now the, the implementation of this is hard to talk through. I would suggest that you look carefully at the textbook or online at any one of a number of sources to try to understand how this works. But the idea here is to keep what's called an alpha beta window. And that's sort of, you keep track at any given state of what's the best score each side could achieve at that state. And at the beginning, you don't know. You don't, you don't know what the heuristic score is that would be best for each side. You, you have sort of minus infinity to infinity. Uh, 
Notice that we've switched from sort of scoring in terms of win, lose, or draw to scoring in material points because that's a more sensitive measure for what we're doing. But at the end of the day, the outcome's still either win, lose, or draw. But so the point is that if I'm trying to estimate, this window closes in the sense that as I find better and better moves for me, when I find a good move for me, that limits the amount of other stuff I have to search. And the goal here is to close it up until I have an exact estimate of the score of each of my moves, of each of the, of the states resulting from each of my moves. And that lets me pick a best move, or at least a heuristically best move because we're depth limiting the search. So double the depth of the search by pruning with optimal move ordering. It's really a big deal that that's true because the second property alpha beta search says is it never changes the answer you'll never get a different estimate with the pruning than you would have got without the pruning if you do it right and so we're literally getting just as good a result at double the you know in terms of quality at the same depths but with half the depth worth of search so this is a super important thing, and this was a game changer for state space search back when it was first discovered in the, I wanna say 60s. Uh, this idea made chess programs go from, computer chess programs go from poor amateur to strong intermediate play instantly, because it turns out that the most important thing you can do is the depth. Improving the heuristics helps. Modern chess programs use heuristics that are w partly machine learned and are way more sophisticated than just material counts. But, and uh, other pruning tricks can speed you up. And there are all kinds of things that you can do. But at the end of the day, if you can search much deeper than your opponent, you will win most of the games over your computer opponent. And if you can search deep enough, you will beat all the humans, sort of everything else aside. So that's very much an introduction to adversary search. I've taught a whole 10 week course on this topic many times. Uh, hopefully it gives you some flavor of why you'd care about it and why it's something that's interesting from an AI perspective. As always, thanks much for listening. As always, please do stay safe and well. And I look forward to talking to you again very soon.